When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows that Steve McQueen ain't got nothing on him. Here is the captain. Yeah, it's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we round out the great summer month of August in my running theme of Clutch 1995 album references. And this, unfortunately, will be our last brewery beer for a while, but we are going out on a high note, my friends. Today, we are very excited to be featuring Sweet Magnolias by the good folks over at the brewery. The one I had came in an absolutely beautiful 12.7 ounce bottle. This is an imperial stout aged in bourbon barrels with bananas, Madagascar, vanilla beans, and vanilla wafers added. Garage grade, sound the trumpets, please. A solid five out of five bottle caps. And let's sound the trumpets for our friends that helped us out with this week's beer fund. First up, a cheers to Alex in Orlando, Florida. And a big shout out to Eric in Lodi, California. Here's a cheers to Hayden in Nightdale, North Carolina. And a big shout-out to Taylor in Old Waterloo. Yeah, Waterloo, Iowa. And last but certainly not least today, we have Haley in Tempe, Arizona. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to TrueCrimeGarage.com and helped us out with this week's beer fund. Yeah, that's what they did because they're awesome. Why aren't you doing it? Are you lazy? You got your lazy pants on? Take your lazy pants off and go to True Crime Garage and donate to the beer fund for our weekly B W E W R U N beer run, and that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Five-year-old Leanna Marie Warner lived with her parents in the remote Iron Range area of northern Minnesota. This entire area has been mined for iron for decades, and there are miles of abandoned ore mines, pits, and lakes created by mining. The area has mountains of iron ore tailings and miles and miles of undisturbed forest. It has been described by people from the area as a vast and endless area of nothingness. 
The town of Chisholm was founded as a mining settlement in this area, the Chippewa called Rough Earth. It's about three hours north of Minneapolis. Leanna lived in the town of Chisholm, Minnesota, a small town of about 5,300 people. The Warner family home was a gray stucco duplex located in a friendly neighborhood with tree-lined blocks of houses in the developed residential area near the iron mines. The neighborhood bordered a lake, Longyear Lake, which was a recreation spot for those who lived in the town. According to everyone who lived there, even in 2003, Chisholm was sort of a throwback. It was a small community where kids played freely outside, Neighbors were friendly, and bad stuff just didn't happen. Leanna Warner, who was five years old, with brown hair and brown eyes, was known as Beaner to almost everyone. The story is that her parents nicknamed her Beaner because when she was born, she reminded them of a little bean pod. The name stuck, and family, friends, and neighbors all called her by this nickname. She was three feet, two inches tall, and weighed 48 pounds. Leanna had a mole on her left leg just above her ankle. Leanna was described as an outgoing, loving little girl who adored dolls, rugrats, Barbies, and babies. There is video footage taken by her parents available online. She was an adorable, normal five-year-old. Little Leanna went missing on a warm midsummer Saturday afternoon from an area in a neighborhood where bad stuff did not happen. The date was June 14th, 2003. Little Leanna walked down the street to play with her friend and is never seen again. For 18 years, her family has held out hope, but not a trace of her has ever been found. How does a child disappear into thin air, seemingly vanishing in an instant off of the face of the earth? This is... It's True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Leanna Warner. Saturday, June 14th, 2003. Leanna and her mom, Kaylin, had hit some yard sales where Leanna bought a heart-shaped pillow. Then they spent the rest of the summer day enjoying the lake. In early interviews, Leanna's mom said that they went to the lake, swam and played with friends and relatives, and returned home around 4.30 p.m. After the day at Longyear Lake, Leanna, like most five-year-olds, would be Well, she was tired from running around in the sun and fell asleep in the car on the way home. When they got to their house located at 19 Southwest 2nd Street, Leanna woke up. While her mom was busy unloading the stuff they had bought from the yard sales from the car and making trips in and out of the house, Leanna asked if she could walk around the corner to their neighbor's house. This is the Quirk family. Their little girls, Janine, age four, and Melissa, age three, were great friends of Leanna's. Apparently, Leanna hung out with Janine and Melissa almost every day. So even though Leanna's mom would have preferred that little Beaner come inside and rest for a bit, Kaylin said, yes, go ahead. It was totally standard procedure for Leanna to walk over to the Quirks to play. Kaylin did tell the media later that she told Leanna to come back home in a half an hour. Although how a five-year-old would have any concept of half of an hour is questionable. Katie Quirk, Janine and Melissa's mother, said that Leanna was a daily visitor to the Quirk house. In fact, Leanna was over at their home the night before on June 13th. She had come over by herself around 7.15 p.m. and watched a movie with the family. In any event, on this Saturday, Leanna got out of the car and walked down the block and around the corner. When her mom last saw her, she was wearing a dark blue sleeveless denim dress with a belt, orange Hanes undies, and a flower petal earring with a red garnet in the middle. 
in her pierced right ear. The reports say that she was not wearing any shoes, which would be in line with a little girl who just got back from a day of swimming. But the shoes will come up again later. Now, the Quirks lived just a few houses away, maybe a block to the south. Leanna would have to cross an alley to get there, and it was around the corner. One article said that it would take an average adult walking at a normal pace no more than two minutes to get from the Warners to the Quirks. As short as the walk was, though, Leanna was not in the sight line of her mother for the entirety of the walk. And no one is really sure how long it was before anyone noticed that she was gone. So Leanna walks off barefoot, and Kaylin goes inside the Warner's home after she says watching Leanna as she walked down their street toward her friend's home until she went around the corner. Two neighbors report seeing Leanna walking that day. The information that one of them gave police tells us something important. Leanna did not go inside the Quirk's house. This neighbor, who was either outside doing something or looking out the window, told police that Leanna climbed the steps to the Quirk's home, knocked on the door. She knocked a few times, but no one answered. It was later confirmed that the Quirks were not home that afternoon. The neighbor reports that after no one answered the door, Leanna turned around and started to walk back toward her home. But at this point, the neighbor stopped watching. Presumably, there was nothing remarkable about this scene, since we know that Leanna was often seen walking to and from the Quirks' home. We know that kids were all over the neighborhood, and it seems that children were allowed to walk around unsupervised. The Chisholm Mayor, John Shampa, lived in the neighborhood about a block from the Warners and said that Leanna, quote, liked to run around the neighborhood but never went far. So apparently Leanna was known to wander around, and clearly the Warners allowed this. The neighbor was in the midst of doing something while observing the door knocking and Leanna not getting admitted into the Quirk's house. And the neighbor turned away and didn't watch anymore, which is such an incredible tragedy. If only the neighbor had watched Leanna continue on her walk, she may have never have vanished. With this case being set in 2003, if it was set in today's time, we'd have ring cameras and, and so many more houses have security cameras that face the street. So we would have a better picture or a better surveillance of what happened to Leanne. And unfortunately, if an abduction did take place, it may have ended up on one of those ring video footage cameras or simply safe video camera video camera footage yeah some news reports say that liana was seen in the area around 6 p.m walking west others say more specifically that she was seen walking west on southwest second or third streets and there were also reports that one neighbor actually spoke with liana and one article says she was seen petting a dog but not all the reports contain all of this information And as we've seen, the timeline on all of this is fuzzy. Police said later that their investigation was hampered by all of the wiggle room in the timeline. Kaylin reported initially that she started to wonder where Leanna was around 6 p.m. We know that Leanna's dad, Chris Warner, went out on an ambulance run at 6.21 p.m. He was a volunteer with the Chisholm Ambulance Service. And it seems that at that time, he did not know that his daughter was missing. So it seems likely that Kaylin actually noticed Leanna being gone later than this. We're going to throw a few questions and wrenches into this timeline as we go, because I think it's right to do so. The first question that's probably spinning around in everybody's mind is, why are you letting a child this young walk to a neighbor's house? Right. That's the first thing I questioned as well. And it seemed odd to me that, Kaylin originally says when they get back to their home, her daughter, Leanna, wants to go down to their friend's house. And then she tells, uh, originally she tells her no, but then the kid does some convincing and she says, yes, but be back in in a half an hour, which seems to me like a why even bother kind of situation. But I really started thinking back to when I was, would have been six or seven years old. I maybe not five. I can't remember, but I can remember the distance that we're talking about traveling here, 
I can remember walking by myself or with a, with a brother or with a friend, no parent, no supervision from adults from my house down to my friend's house on the corner, Tim and Vince and regularly making that trip. And it was literally passing like three houses. And so I think what we have here, Captain, is a situation where I think it's right to question it. The little girl is five years old, but we have her mom, her father, and the Quirks family, the adults of that home, saying this was an everyday thing. This was, you know, as normal as could be. Yeah, but it's different to allow your child to walk down there, but just step outside visually see them make it into the house. If you were a parent and you drove your kid to their friend's house, you wouldn't just go, Hey honey, thanks. Get out of the car. And once they leave the car, you don't speed away. You, you wait until you see them enter the house. Right. And I'm just saying that you could have done the same thing here. Agreed. But in this situation, we have Kaylin who says she watched Leanna walk down the street until she could no longer see her because she has to make a turn. And again, I question this too, but then I'd have to question my own parents because I know I was doing about the same thing. I think what we have here too, Captain, is a situation where a lot of kids in the neighborhood are going about their business and having fun unsupervised. It seemed to be a pretty normal thing. And then you top that off with a town of only 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. I think a small town sometimes is plays a bad role in some of these cases. I think sometimes the small town provides a false sense of security to parents and to children and to everyone involved. And like I try to tell other people, you know, that they say, Oh, so you live in a bad neighborhood or, or this area is terrible. And yes, that's true. You do have higher crime rates in bad areas, quote unquote, bad areas. But again, look at Sandy hook. That was considered one of the nicest, safest neighborhoods in America, right. not in the state, not in that county, in America. And if something bad is going to happen, if there's a bad person out there, it can happen anywhere. It can only happen in America. And like you were stating, Kaylin was saying, you can be gone, but for just a little while. Mm-hmm. And so once she noticed that she hasn't come back in a little while, she starts getting a little concerned. Yeah, her first reaction, as soon as she notices Leanna is not home, you know, didn't return home as she should have. Kaylin walks down to the quirks home herself, but then that's when she finds out that no one is home. Right. So according to Kaylin, she started canvassing the neighborhood, assuming that Leanna had just wandered to someone else's yard or home. And again, this kind of plays into what even the mayor of Chisholm was saying Mm. that he would often see the little girl hanging out, you know, going about the neighborhood looking for friends looking for people to talk to and hang out and play with. I also wondered if it's a possibility that she got turned around and when she came back, got a little confused on which house was actually hers. Yeah, it's weird when kids have kind of the run of the neighborhood is what I see in this situation. Again, thinking back to my childhood, I lived on a court when in my younger years and I felt like, I don't know, remember what the rules were laid down by my parents, but I know the way I behaved was kind of like, well, as long as I'm still somewhere in this court, I won't get in any trouble. Mm-hmm. You know, so I would walk freely between front yards, backyards, and there was even a wooded area that I would often go into without permission. So that's, I just kind of see a very similar situation here. This is not just a small community, but this is a tight knit neighborhood itself. Chris Warner joined his wife in the search for Leanna when he got home from his ambulance run. This is said to be around 7.40 p.m. He said that they were walking around the neighborhood calling for her and they started to get scared. Kaylin returned to the Quirks home looking for Leanna again at 8.30 p.m., this time finding them home. But they had not seen Leanna at this whole point. Right. The 911 call from Kaylin Warner came in at 8.48 p.m. By this point, Leanna was missing for more than three hours. The official search for Leanna began extremely promptly, and I think a lot of this has to do with the age of the child. The St. Louis County Rescue Squad set up a command center and organized searches within about an hour of receiving that 911 call. 
By late Saturday night, police sent out a helicopter that was equipped with an infrared tracing system that could pinpoint body heat in the night. Neighbors also pitched in. The Quirks reported that they all went out to help look for Leanna around 9 p.m. By Sunday morning, a major search was underway. That day, over 300 people joined in the search for Leanna, including town residents, neighbors, and friends of the little girl. The search started at the Warner home and worked its way outward, looking in all the places a child could hide or get stuck or trapped. This would be sheds, boathouses, boats, yards, sewers, barns, and vacant houses. Mm -hmm. Searches were also done of some of the mine pits, swamps, wells, and other hazards in the Iron Range topography. Do you know if they had scent dogs on scene? They did. Bloodhounds were sent in relatively quickly. I believe that they arrived either that night or the the right. very next morning. I have that in my notes, and I promise we'll get to that, Captain. We did have a statewide alert that was issued on Sunday morning by the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Mm-hmm. A BCA is their uh, acronym. We'll, we'll reference them later. And the Minnesota Crime Alert Network faxed information about Leanna to over 8,000 businesses and law enforcement agencies. However, no Amber Alert was issued, and this is because uh, Chisholm Police Chief Scott Erickson stated Amber Alerts were appropriate when there was evidence of an abduction, and there wasn't here. And we've seen that in other cases. They have a recommended criteria for when states should use the amber alert system they don't tell you you know they don't they don't box you in and say this is the only time you should use it they give you recommendations for the state and one of the recommendations is that you have a suspect or vehicle description and unfortunately in leanna's case we have people who see her knocking on the door of her friend's house we have people that see her walking away from her friend's house And then we never see anything after that. Mm -hmm. We don't have a situation where we have a screaming little girl being pulled into a vehicle or somebody snatching her up and somebody seeing it. We just don't have that. We have no ear witnesses or eyewitnesses to what happened to this little girl after she's seen walking away from her friend's house. Yeah. And I don't know what else they would call it, but I think in this situation, when you have a missing child, whether they are abducted or not, How can it hurt to send these alerts out to have people on the lookout for, even if it's just simply the age, hair color, the gender, that's it. It couldn't hurt. Well, I agree, but I mean, they did send out these alerts. It's just what title are you tagging this thing? Right. They, I mean, they issued a statewide alert by the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and they issued a crime alert. The Minnesota Crime Alert Network issued an alert as well. I mean, it, this went out statewide. They just didn't call it an Amber Alert because it didn't meet the criteria for technical name like the Amber Alert requires. It seems that at least early in the situation, police knew that Leanna's reputation was as a wanderer. You know, as they said, and assumed that Leanna had just kind of wandered off or gotten lost or stuck or maybe had some accident befall her. Erickson said that on Sunday, this is the chief, that there was nothing indicating foul play. Chief Erickson held a press conference on Sunday night and described Leanna as an energetic, outgoing little girl. You asked about dogs, Captain. Dogs were used in the search, and they tracked Leanna's scent to the edge of a road at Longyear Lake, about two blocks from her house. But then they tracked back to the Warner home. They did not track to the Quirks house. Police found a partial footprint lakeside that could have been Leanna's. But we know that Leanna was at the lake that day, and that she had ridden her two-wheel bike to the lake in the past. Later reports, this is bizarre to me, later reports say police decided that the footprint was in fact from a different day. I'm not sure how they can tell this footprint was old or that it could have been Maybe it was a different shoe and that they knew which shoe she was wearing that day. Yeah. They describe it as a footprint. Um, 
Oh, not a shoe print. I'm yeah, flipping. I mean, it could have been a shoe print. This is one of those things that they seem to have come to a lot of decisions and, and made up, you know, they seem to have a good understanding of what it is that they were seeing or what they found, but they don't offer a great description to the rest of the world about it. it do you the, find it a little odd that there was no scent towards her friend's house? I do and I don't, right? Because here's the problem with the with the dogs. The dogs are one only as good as they have been trained and mm -hmm. their understanding of what their job is. We forgot to tell you that their handler showed up drunk. Well, and I was going to say they're also only as good as the handler. So you're already throwing a lot of variables in there. I think they're very helpful in some cases and in other cases can be a little tricky. I mean, mm. the here's the problem with the dogs in this situation. Do I find it odd that they didn't go to the Quirks house? 100%. 1,000%. Mm. But we have two eyewitnesses that saw the girl there. So we know she was there. So the, in my opinion, the dogs are just Wrong. not accurate in this situation. The other thing, too, in regards to the footprint or shoe print or what have you, yes, maybe there could be it rained the day before or, you know, given the weather outside, how hot it is and such, that would help you determine how old the footprint or shoe print is. But the other issue I take with that, Captain, is this lake, as we referenced in the trailer, this lake was frequented by everybody in that neighborhood. This was a Saturday in the summertime. If anybody's out there thinking that, that Leanna and her mom and her sister were the only three people at that lake that day, well, you're... You can tune into another show because you don't belong here in the garage. There were probably dozens, if not more, people at the lake that very day. On Sunday, searchers waded up to their waist in the murky lake to no avail. The search continued on Monday with large groups of volunteers, and Leanna's parents made a televised plea for her to come home. Her father, Chris, said, quote, please, Beaner, come home. We miss you. We're never going to stop looking for you. End quote. St. Louis County Sheriff Ross Littman said there was no reason to believe acquaintances or family members would have taken the girl. He cited a trouble-free home and no evidence of a stranger abduction. But law enforcement was acutely aware that the small town of friendly residents had also been the site of two events that brought out-of-towners to Chisholm on that very weekend in June. First, we have the Rock the Range Music Festival that had brought in lots of people. And there was also the United Way Ride the Range Motorcycle Fundraiser. Reports state that these events could have brought more than 1,000 people into this small town. So think about that population increase just for that weekend, the weekend that this little girl goes missing. Mm -hmm. 5,300 residents in the town of Chisholm. That weekend, it's estimated that there were 6,300 and so people in the area. Festival goers were permitted to camp at the Old Glen Mine site. It would be impossible to track down everyone who attended these events. Law enforcement did what they could do to track down people that may have attended these events. They used motel, gas station, and campground records to get names of people who attended these events and questioned them. Well, no, we see this all the time in other missing cases. Look at like the Joey Labute case. Guy goes missing when there's a huge, the Arnold Classic is in town. Mm -hmm. So again, when you have those outer towners, it's really hard to vet every single person that was there. Mm -hmm. And if anybody was still in the area that came in for these events, the police asked to check their RVs and their campsites, obviously looking for Leanna or any sign of her. Police also started looking into known sex offenders in the area. On Tuesday, authorities were still treating Leanna's case as a search rather than a rescue or recovery, although they hadn't ruled out abduction. Sheriff Littman said he felt it was unlikely that Leanna was in the lake and he believed Leanna could have survived 72 hours in the woods on the Iron Range. She was known to be pretty adventurous, her grandfather Butch Warner said. 
that if necessary, she would very likely drink from mud puddles if she had to. And she had been known to eat army worms. I don't know if that was off of a dare or if this is just one really hungry kid. That girl likes worms. It's been raining for days here in Columbus and it smells like worms outside. <laughs> the search radius. You smell like worms. You know, here's the other thing too is, you know, my thought goes instantly when you have a situation where she's, she's seen close to the home, you start then questioning the parents, right? Mm-hmm. And now my issue with the investigation is, and look, we're going to argue with people to the death about polygraph tests. But to me, you bring them in for questioning and you have them take a polygraph test Mm -hmm. just to see where it stands. They didn't do that here. And I know that they weren't suspect, but it's like, I think you just do it to, you know, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's. Well, and the other thing, Captain, is that's your best opportunity, right? If you're hoping to catch somebody, even if it is the parents that you suspect, you get really one shot at that. You know, the the investigation is only in the early stages at one point right. in the investigation. And to me, I would think that that's when whomever you sit down across the table from and who you are asking them the tough questions, that's when I think they would be the most nervous, be it parents, relative, neighborhood person, any type of suspect, I would think that fresh and early, that's when they're going to be the most nervous. And that's when they are going to show those physical signs of deception or at least anxiety of not wanting to speak with you. So I'm, I'm right with you there, captain. I feel like that could have been, while I'm not very suspicious of the parents here, I feel like that was kind of a missed opportunity. We've said this in the past, even if you're not suspicious, Let's go ahead and cross one more thing off of our list. If we can't figure out who did this, let's figure out who did not do this. And maybe we find who did this along the way. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot. And it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single-line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single-line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. All right, we're back, you filthy animals. Cheers to everybody out there. Cheers to all the post workers. Cheers to all the school bus drivers that are going to be bringing the kids back to school. Yeah, cheers to all the people in the back, tall cans in the air. Now, regards to in regards to Leanna's shoes, mm-hmm. 
because that's a weird part of this story. And frankly, I don't know what to make of it. So we're going to lay it out here for all of you and you can decide for yourself. But one or two articles address the shoes being found on the stoop at the Quirks house. And Kaylin Warner, her mother, stated to the media that Leanna's shoes were, in fact, found there. And no one could explain that or why. Well, there's eyewitnesses that saw her barefoot, right? Correct. It's, it, the shoes thing is a whole weird thing to me. We don't know when these shoes were supposedly found. Mm-hmm. All the reports say that Leanna had walked away from her house barefoot. It would certainly be strange if somehow her shoes had been placed there by someone else, obviously. I think it's more likely that she probably just carried them with her when she got out of the car and her mother didn't notice that she was carrying her shoes. Right. And then maybe Leanna forgot them when she turned away from the house. I mean, she's five. She, If she set them down by herself, and if in fact that's where they were found, and I don't have any reason to believe that that's not the case. I just, I don't know why the child would set her shoes yeah, down. Yeah, let's walk through this real quick. She would, well, yeah, but she'd put her shoes down so she could ring the doorbell or knock on the door. Nobody answers. When she turns back around to leave, then she forgets the she shoes. She may have simply forgot them. Right. By Wednesday, with no sign of Leanna, hope was beginning to fade for the first time members of the public began to seriously consider the abduction theory. A local daycare center owner said that in a newspaper article that she hired an extra person to help watch the kids in her care and she'd like police to publicize the names of local registered sex offenders. Police said that they had checked all of the known local sex offenders by this point in their search for the little girl. Again, I hate to bring this up, but like you said, there's an event that's bringing all these people in. There's a percentage of those people that are pedos. Well, and this timeline is going to keep getting adjusted, especially during this first week, which a, a timeline is very crucial to not only the search for this girl, but any type of investigation. You're not just investigating if a cr- when you know that a crime has happened. Here, you're investigating if a crime occurred. Right. And so the timeline is going to be crucial. I mean, that is your Bible at this point in the case when you have no evidence and you don't really have any leads on what could have happened to this girl. As an investigator, that timeline is your Bible. Now, police interviews and canvassing the neighborhood did bring some new information to light to their search. The timeline was adjusted to indicate that Leanna had left home closer to 530 on Saturday. And you say, well, earlier you said 430. Now the investigators are saying 530. Again, they said at the very beginning of this case that the wiggle room in the timeline has always hampered their investigation. As we heard, someone in the neighborhood said that they had seen her walking west at close to 6 p.m. Authorities requested that everyone in the area check their own properties to make sure the little girl was not at their property. The family made a public statement thanking all of the searchers, saying they were Iron Rangers, a strong, compassionate, resourceful people who know the meaning of faith. Presumably, this means that they were drawing on their strength and not giving up hope. Leanna's grandfather talked to the media, describing his granddaughter as an inquisitive child, who is not afraid of anything. He said her outgoing nature and free spirit could have gotten her into trouble. The implication was that Leanna was trusting and friendly and might innocently be lured by the wrong person. The parents of other children in the neighborhood, the grandfather, they're all describing the same personality when I review this case here, Captain. A little girl that is is very friendly and very talkative, and not afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. And I think the grandfather's words here are very interesting to me, saying that her free spirit and her outgoing nature may have gotten her into some kind of trouble. I wonder if we are looking at an abduction here, do we have a situation where she may have approached her would-be abductor, not knowing that, oh, this, this person may not be a great person, this person might not be, you know, had she befriended the would-be abductor at some point earlier on before this day, you know, weeks prior. Right. 
Investigators announced that they were further expanding the search. This would include roadways and ditches throughout Chisholm and flybys over the local lakes and mine pits. They plan to retrace their steps and research all of the areas that they had already covered. There were fundraisers that were held to raise money for the search efforts and hotlines were set up to field calls about any tips and potential leads. But just when we think that there's nothing to go on other than probably a few tips here and there, we, we have a decent break in the case. An interesting turn in the case, because this is late Thursday. So now Leanna has been missing for six days. And the tone of the news reports and information released by investigators is clearly changing in my mind here, Captain. We have Police Chief Erickson, who directly asked the public to contact his department if anyone had any information on a faded light blue mid-size car with an antenna mounted in the middle of the trunk. There was no make, model, or license plate that was available. Erickson said he did not know whether this vehicle was actually significant, but it was a lead that they were following up on. And Chief Erickson said that areas around the block where the Warner's home was located had been searched anywhere from two to five times each, including homes in the vicinity. It seems that most or all neighbors allowed the police to actually access and search their houses. Erickson was confident that they had the area 98% covered. So this is going to be like Erickson's legit press conference after we've had several days of searching and have had no luck looking for the girl. The thing that I like here, Captain, while it's not extremely specific on the details, you know, no make, model, or license plate of this vehicle it's a pretty detailed description of a very, I don't want to say very unique, but it is a unique description of a car, right? Yeah. This light blue, faded light blue. So very descriptive on the color, mid-sized car with an antenna mounted in the middle of the trunk. That's not something you see on most vehicles. Yeah, it sounds like something you'd see in this late 70s, 80s. Yeah, it seems a little out of its time period. And the news reports once again addressed an adjustment to the timeline. Now Leanna was believed to have left her home at 4.35 p.m., not 5 or 5.30. Two independent witnesses saw her walking across lawns and knocking on the Quirk's door at 5.15, and she was reported missing at 8.48 p.m. Now, back to the sex offenders in the area. As you know, Captain one of my favorite parts in any child abduction case or suspected child abduction case is the old pervert roundup. Get ready for the pervert roundup. A spokesman for the Chisholm PD said that there were roughly 20 to 25 classified sex offenders in Chisholm, but none mm. that were level three. We've talked about this in the past and I've come under fire for this and I don't know why I suspect that I came under fire from probably a level three sex offender. But uh, the level three sex offenders have the highest recidivism rates out of any sex offender. That's why they are considered the most dangerous. That's why they received the longest prison sentences. And that's why nobody wants to let them out back on the street. The police are saying here in this area, we had zero level three offenders. And that's so we just have level one, and level, level ones two, and level twos, dirty pervies. Mm -hmm. So no level threes. This is why their names and addresses were not required to be released to the public. 30 investigators from various agencies, including the FBI, were looking at each one of these guys, as well as all of the other tips and leads. And so far had not been able to tie any of these perverts to Leanna's case. One thing that has been noticed since Leanna's disappearance 18 years ago is that her case didn't receive the level of national attention immediately in this case, such as some other cases like Polly class or another big case from Minnesota, Jacob Wetterling. This may be because it seems that for almost the first week, no one, including Leanna's parents really thought that she had been abducted and both the Polly class case and the Jacob Wetterling case, there were witnesses to these abductions. So we knew immediately in both of those cases this child has been abducted. Mm -hmm. Leanna, on the other hand, just vanished. 
a spokeswoman for the Missing Children Minnesota organization said that the delay in treating these cases as abductions early on is, quote, the disbelief factor. No one wants to believe the worst can happen in their backyard. Also, there's a fear of pointing the finger at an innocent person, especially in an area where, one, you have a lake. So that is going to cause a lot of issues Mm -hmm. as far as searching. Also, a lot of issues as far as a big hazard for a child that is wandering on their own. And like they said, the wooded area, I'd say that's an equal problem. Now it's middle of June, right? So there's, you don't have to worry about the elements as far as it's snowing or being too cold, but you have to worry about the elements of being in the woods as a small child. Right. And speaking of own backyards, This is when we're told in our timeline here that eight square miles around the Warner home had been searched by this point. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children was called in to join in the investigation on Friday, June 20th. And spokesman Patrick Farrell said, in my own personal experience, I haven't had a case where a child has disappeared so completely. Now, Chief Erickson remained optimistic saying anything is possible but unfortunately we've found nothing so far yeah and he was holding out hope that they were still going to find this girl but on saturday june 21st the warner family was notified that the organized official searches for liana were coming to an end investigators felt that they had exhaustively covered any ground where she could have re where she could realistically be The family thanked all the searchers and asked that people not give up hope and said that they themselves were still hoping for the best. And I think that's obvious when they point out that very quickly they are putting up $10,000, a $10,000 reward for information about their daughter. This was publicized just a couple days later. Like you said, she was at the lake before, but there's a possibility that she got back to the lake. Were they searching the lake at all? They like, searched I, the lake big time. Mm-hmm. Um, they they were in the water searching for her. They were flying over the water searching yeah. for her. The lake was a big focal point of their investigation, especially that second day, mm-hmm. that Sunday morning. And they, again, as the sheriff stated, at some point after a few days of searching, and we've covered all this area, In the beginning, you're looking and you're realistically going, okay, how far, if she got lost, we're treating this as she wandered off, she got lost, maybe an accident, something happened to her. Right. How far could a five-year-old get on their own given the time frame that she's been gone? And so you're using that to really focus and hone in on where you should be searching and prioritizing those areas. So the lake would have been high priority on that because- This is a place that not only was she there earlier that day, not only was this a place that most everybody in the neighborhood went to frequently, we know that she has rode her bike there at least one time on her own. So this is a place that there's nowhere in this neighborhood or down to that lake to me that I can see that this girl would not have been comfortable going to by herself. I think the other issue, like you said, is they they do a eight mile radius from the house that is a very large distance yeah eight square miles from uh the warner home yeah once that search happens and and they not it's not just that they don't they don't find her it's the fact that they find nothing they don't find a sock they don't find a footprint they don't there's nothing well and we needed to get the word out here right about this missing girl we already said that there were statewide alerts that went out immediately when she was discovered to be missing, but it was the missing children, Minnesota and the national center for missing and exploited children organizations that highly encouraged the Warners to go national with their daughter's case. And so they went on several national televised TV shows and they were publicizing the case and a website that they created findbeaner.org And accompanying them on these trips and on these uh, appearances was Chief Erickson. So they are in close contact with one another. They're working arm in arm 
in this investigation, not just to search and find the child, but also to publicize the case and make everybody aware that, hey, this little girl's missing and we're looking for her. Here's where things get a little interesting to me, Captain. On June 24th, a timeline of what authorities believe happened that night on June 14th, so 10 days later, appeared in the Minneapolis Star Tribune. So this will be known as the quote-unquote official timeline here in this case. And it's as follows. At 4.35 p.m., Leanna leaves to walk to the Quirks home. Mom tells her to be back in a half an hour. At 5.15, two neighbors see Leanna knocking on the door of the Quirks home, but no one is home and she turns around. 5.30 p.m., Kaylin notices that Leanna isn't home yet. She sends Leanna's older sister over to the Quirks, but she returns and reports that they are not home. 6 to 6.30 p.m., Kaylin and Leanna's sister start walking around the neighborhood looking for Leanna. At 621, we know that Chris Warner leaves on an ambulance run to Hibbing, Minnesota. He does not seem to know that Leanna is missing at this point. At 730, more people join Kalen in the search of the neighborhood. At 747, Chris Warner's ambulance run ends and he returns home. He immediately joins the search for his daughter. At 848, Kalen Warner places the 911 call to report Leanna missing. 9 p.m., 12 minutes later, Chisholm police arrive and start searching the neighborhood. 10.15 p.m., rescue squad personnel and bloodhounds, so the dogs are there at 10.15 p.m., arriving on the scene. 4 a.m. Sunday, a state patrol helicopter is out searching for Leanna by air. They move very quickly. We got to give props where props are due, and I think to see the actions And the efforts put forward immediately in this case is encouraging to me because we've, we've seen this in other cases. Well, we've not seen this in other cases, I think is the best way to state that this timeline though, to me, captain brings up some questions. If Leanna really left the Warner's home at four 35 PM and neighbors saw her knocking on the quirk store at five 15, where was she for that 40 minutes? Yeah. We said that it would take the average adult. It was time. They did, they did, you know, this is all science here, baby. They figured out that it would take the average adult two minutes to make it from the Warner's home to the Quirk's home. So again, that's one of those things. Yes. If you want to question, letting your five-year-old walk down there, go ahead. I don't blame you for questioning that. Keep in mind, it's like a two minute walk and it's a, it's a walk that she's done a hundred times. I question it myself. Not going to lie, but be that as it may, this is the situation. So let's say it takes a little girl double that time, five minutes to walk down there. Mm -hmm. That still leaves 35 minutes of what's going on. And, you know, little kids get distracted easily. Heck, me and the captain get distracted easily. Who knows? Hey, look, a squirrel. But we don't have anybody that's saying that, well, I saw her go here or saw her go there at this time. We have the witness statement of her mother saying, I saw her walking away from the house. I watched her until she had to go around the corner. And then we have these two witnesses. I like that we have two independent witnesses saying that they saw her at the Quirks doorstep and they believe the time to be 5.15 p.m. Well, we know with eyewitness statements that sometimes they're not lying. They're just misremembering. But I don't like her mother's statement. If there's a gap, that large of a gap, to me, it seems like she headed in a different direction before she headed to her friend's house. That's also what the scent dogs are telling us as well, because they're not following her scent to her friend's house. So I just wonder if it's one of those scenes where your kid's missing, and now, um, again, you should have watched her all the way. You could have walked her all the way to your house. People are going to be questioning this. And so then you make the statement that you watched her walk towards the house and walk out of sight. And maybe that's not true at all. Mm-hmm. And maybe it was, she's you know putting groceries away and she goes, I'm going to walk down to my friend's house. And she goes, okay, back, be back in 20 minutes. I never saw her leave. I would fault her for not being honest, but I could also see a situation. We've seen these situations turn against the parents very quickly. And, they be, there becomes a wit there becomes a witch hunt against parents 
because they made a let's say a moment of not the best judgment oh yeah they unfortunately they live with that every day yeah for 18 years i mean that is do you want to know what hell is that's what hell is now in regards to the dogs here's the problem again with the dogs you have to either throw out the dog information or the eyewitness information that said that they saw the girl knocking on the door of the Quirks home. You can't have both, right? Because the dogs never go to the Quirks house. They go and hit on a scent at the lake. They say that they trace Leanna's scent to the edge of a road near the lake. We've discussed this in other cases, Captain. Usually when they trace ascent to an edge of the road, it indicates that that person got into some kind of vehicle because their scent is then gone. Right. The dogs then trace the scent back to Leanna Warner's home. Again, they're only as good as the handler, but you can't have a situation where the, what the dogs are telling you is that Leanna did not go to the Quirks home. What the eyewitnesses are telling you is that she did. So you have to choose which one are you going to accept as something you want to put in your investigation mm-hmm. and something that you're going to have to toss out because you might be getting bad information from someone. Now, here's the thing. If the dogs never go to the Quirks home and you trust the dogs, now you need to know why people would say that she went to the Quirks home and she didn't. You see what I mean? It works both ways. No, I agree. And like I said, back to the eyewitnesses, we just, we know for a fact that eyewitnesses are not always completely accurate. So it's not calling them liars. It's just saying that maybe you're misremembering. Right. I, the thing that I believe here and look, this is, I, yes, I'm, I'm choosing, I'm, I'm, I'm picking one over the other. I'm choosing these eyewitnesses here because what what we do know, given the timeline, regardless of the shift and the change and the wiggle room in the timeline, what we do know is very quickly after this girl went missing, Mm -hmm. the mother, the daughter, and neighbors are out searching for Leanna very quickly. Mm -hmm. Let's say within, I think we can agree within half an hour to an hour and a half, somewhere in that time range, we have, we start seeing people from the neighborhood and joining in on this search. So what I'm, the reason why I'm choosing to believe the eyewitnesses here is simply that they can speak and the dogs can't because we have eyewitnesses that are going, this is all going to be fresh in their memory. It's not like you're asking somebody five days later, if you saw Leanna on Saturday or Friday or Sunday, Mm -hmm. you're asking them, did you see her an hour ago? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Well, a couple things. One, if you if you eat enough edibles, dogs will talk to you and you'll be able to understand them. Um, and normally I always pick dogs over humans, right? Because dogs are just better. But I agree with you here. I, I think you have to go with the eyewitness report. I just I I just don't understand why there's a, a gap in time between the eyewitnesses and her. Leanne's mother. So I'm totally with you here. And I, here's what I think may be a possibility. I think that maybe this little girl was excited about seeing her friends hanging Mm -hmm. out with her two friends. We know that they hung out almost daily. I think that there's a chance that they're seeing these witnesses might be seeing her later than the time that it would take her to walk from her home to the quirks home. Because I think there's a chance that when th- she knocked on the door the first time and no one answered, she might have gone looking for them. And it could be as simple as she went around to the backyard to see if they were out back. Maybe she started to make her way toward the lake or to somebody else's home that they frequented. I think there's a chance that she may have tried that front door more than once and gone looking for them in the meantime, uh, looking for her friends. Again, well, no, that's a great point because if you were to bike, even if it's not that far, you you knock on the door. Right. Nobody answers. You might do the old step back, look at the windows, see if there's any lights on. You might do the old, let me walk around the house. Maybe they're playing out back. Maybe there's a swing set that we haven't talked about or a play area in the backyard that she went to go see if they're there. Oh, they're not there. Okay, now I'm coming back around and 
and having a second pass. And heck, there could even have been a third pass. And just think about how silly we are when we're all kids, right? When you when you ask, hey, can I the go silliest. hang out with can mm-hmm. I go hang out with my friends? You're five, six years old. Hey, can I go hang out with my friends? And you're granted permission to do so. That mm-hmm. becomes the most important thing in your little universe for that next half an hour or an hour, right? Seeing your friends and your buddies. And, and as you pointed out, I'm again, thinking back to my own childhood, I've re- referenced friends, Tim and Vince earlier and being about that same age. And I can, I can recall similar situations, granted permission, go to their home. Nobody answers. Uh, where would I go next? Well, there was a fort that we built two yards away. That mm-hmm. would be my next stop. They're probably at the fort. If they weren't there, Sometimes they were at Sean's house and you would see their bikes in the driveway and you could tell you could walk a few more yards and see if the bikes were in the driveway or not. And so I worry that we have a situation here, Captain, where Leanna's playing detective herself, trying to figure out where her friends are. And now she's wandering about. And maybe, as said, the witnesses, the eyewitnesses are getting this 515 time from a second attempt at knocking on the door after she's gone out looking the neighborhood for her friends. Mm -hmm. One thing that's also difficult and troubling here, I mean, this is good for the parents and the people searching for Leanna that night, but also might be bad because she could be wandering further and further away from home is June 14th is close to one of the longest days of the year. So it would remain light out much longer on this day than most days of the year sunset in Chisholm, Minnesota on June 14th of this year of 2021 was nine fourteen PM. So it's one of those situations where you go, okay, lots of daylight hours between the time of when she goes missing or when it's presumed that she, she goes missing. Mm-hmm. Why don't we have more eyewitnesses? If something happened to her, it seemed to me like it, it happened in a relatively quick and a relatively short period of time. Like you said, to go back in time to think about how this would play out in your own childhood. But, you know, normally when I'd ask my parents, like, hey, can I go play with my friends? They would just turn and go, oh, honey, you don't have any friends. On July 3rd, so weeks after Leanna went missing, investigators had looked into an estimated 1,000 leads or tips. Investigators spoke with 130 sex offenders who lived in northern Minnesota, calling some persons of interest. On July 9th, investigators asked for the public's help in finding three men who may have information that would be helpful to this investigation. They were looking for a Sean Raymond Burtick of Hibbing, Jason Wayne Smith of Hibbing, and Justin Michael Jenkins of Chisholm. The sheriff's office also asked for the public's help in finding an unidentified white man in his mid-30s, about 5 foot 10 inches tall and 155 pounds, with bleach blonde hair feathered over his ears and a dark tattoo of a star or a sun on his right arm, wearing blue jeans and a white t-shirt. This man was supposedly seen on foot in the Warner's neighborhood on June 14th, the day in question. They also said that they were looking for a navy blue two-door Cadillac driven by a black male in his 20s or 30s that was either bald or had a shaven head. And an older, rusty brown pickup truck with a topper driven by a white man with curly black hair. The sheriff's department would not say why they were seeking these people, but we can presume that persons in the neighborhood reported seeing them in the area. In an interesting statement, though, Sheriff Littman said he believed, despite public events in the area at the time of Leanna's disappearance, that the person who was responsible for Leanna going missing was likely from Chisholm. At the same time, authorities said there was no truth to media reports that identified a 23-year-old convicted sex offender as a suspect in the case. They denied that there was a suspect and stated that this man was in custody on unrelated charges. Now we're really seeing the scale of this investigation here, aren't we, Captain? This is something that we've seen in 
other cases, specifically the Delphi case, where you start seeing the, the long arms of the law are reaching out and they are casting a wide net on known offenders, suspects, people seen in the area, questionable behavior, all of that stuff. That's what's going on here. That's what's going down at this point. Mm -hmm. And we saw at the Delphi case, how many search warrants and how many arrest warrants were, the arrest warrants were carried out. There was like 40, 50, 60 carried out within days because now all of a sudden the priority level jumps big time to start finding people, the, the bad guys, start rounding up the bad guys at this point. And that's what we're seeing an amped up, not only just amped up, but here to the point where they're saying to the public, hey, we're looking for these people by name. We're looking for people that were described to be looking like this. We're not saying any of them are suspects. Any of them could have useful information to this investigation. Well, like you said, there's a bunch of people visiting this town during that time period. So now as this is going out more regionally, you have people coming forward and saying, Hey, I know that this dirt bag in my family was visiting there at the time. He's capable of abducting a child. So now they got to find that individual, which might be living a criminal life. And then that criminal or that, that dirt bag now has to explain to the police where he was at and where, you know, what's his alibi. And sometimes they're not as cooperative with police police because their alibi is that they're actually doing some other kind of criminal activity. Well, and even if they weren't getting reports that people that were named specifically were in the area at that time, because we're kind of guessing here, but you also have to wonder, is that simply that these known, these known individuals, the ones that they're referencing by name, are these people that have outstanding warrants or are sex offenders? I don't know that they are, but th we weren't able to find them when we started doing our roundup or we started looking for bad guys to talk to or serving these arrest warrants. These are people that we could not find and we want to know why we couldn't find them. And then the people that were that you're asking the public for and you're simply giving a description of them, well, that's very interesting too because obviously these are not people that are they're being told their names. So if people saw them in the neighborhood, you have the, the neighborhood person telling police, here's a description of the person. Why is that interesting to me? Why am I bringing it up to you, Mr. Lawman? Uh, that's because I'd never seen this person in the neighborhood before. But I saw them on that day, and that's the day that we're talking about. And so now, as an investigator, you're going, okay, I want to find bleach blonde hair guy. I want to find the African-American male with the shaved head. I want to find the guy dri driving the creepy camper pickup truck. Why? Because I want to ask them what you were doing there that day. And if I can clear you or if I can immediately tell that there's little reason to suspect you of any wrongdoing based off of the information you're able to prove to me and tell me that day, then I, only, I also want to talk to you not just to clear you or check you off my list. I want to ask you, did you see anything that day? Did you hear anything that day? Maybe you're the witness that we've been looking for that can give us the clue that's going to lead us to this little girl. So much more to get to. Please join us here for episode two. And until tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't let it.
Angie's List You Know and Trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.